Hello, it's Jim Spodek. Uh, I'm the director producer of the documentary Pattern of Practice. This is my first video in a series of videos that will explain the reason for the documentary um, and kind of get into the, the, the kind of the back room, I guess you'd say, of how it was made and why it was made. Um, right from the beginning, uh, I, I want to clarify that I was part of this. I owned a building uh, that was. Um, uh, in the middle of the controversy. Uh, I rented to a, uh, a one of the plaintiffs in the, a lawsuit that uh, we'll explain later, uh, Thomas Holmes, Park 6. So I'm going to start right there. This was the building. It was located in downtown Racine. Um, as you can see, these are some shots of the interior of the building. Um, he operated mostly on Friday and Saturday nights, uh, the crowds probably were most concentrated between 9 and 2 in the morning on those two nights. And so, okay, before we get into it a little deeper, I want to kind of take you on the same journey that I went on uh, through this period of time. Now, this was 2009 when uh, Thomas Holmes took over. But before that, I had a couple. Um, uh, one was an attorney and one was... Um, uh, she operated Latin Fest in Milwaukee and had a radio show and a few things. They were looking to occupy this building. It was going to be called Tanita's, which would have been a kind of a salsa dance club. Um, it had been built for it. It was, uh, you know, what I have hoped to have occupy it. So uh, during this period of time, uh, they were in to apply for their license. Now, I would go to some of these meetings because I thought, well, they're going to need maybe some uh, background on the you know the leasing of the building or whatever. If they had questions, I was going to be there to answer them. So this was really the first time and the first indication I had that uh, you know uh, institutionalized racism and and how subtle it can be. This particular what I'm going to show you is not all that subtle, but it does kind of uh, uh, kind of open your eyes a little bit to uh, uh, how this can happen in a community um, right under your nose. Uh, there was an incident in that when. When I show this, uh, before that they uh, required a, uh, a meet and greet with the neighbors, and uh, of course the Tanitas uh, brought in some uh, refreshments and you know demonstrated the salsa dancing. Now this had never been done before. She put this on, did a very nice job with it, and it was just a disaster because people came in there. What kind of people are going to come here? You know, are we going to have fights? Is this going to be a, 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 a? She brought the fact up that this was the first time that they may use uh, metal detectors at the door wands, and uh, that seemed to make a considerable amount of problems for the neighbors and and some of the city officials. So. This clip is uh, in the documentary, but it does bring up, this is actually Tanita's uh, asking for their liquor license and um, some of the uh, reaction that some of the council members had. Dress codes were built in. The applicant agreed to some very restrictive, probably the most restrictive agreements we've ever put on, a, um, on an establishment one that hasn't even opened its doors yet. There are more restrictions on this particular place and they don't even have their first dollar framed behind the bar. There are more restrictions on this place than there are in taverns where people have been killed. This is sort of uh, making sure, it's like an insurance policy, thank you, that, uh, that things will go okay and if they don't, we won't be stuck with a problem uh, and uh, that we can't get out of in time. Like I said, it's not very subtle. It pretty much spells it out and says there's more restrictions on you than we're going to put on someone else. So you have this divide here because if it's a, a salsa club, Hispanic, uh, right from the beginning, this is the kind of idea. Now, this is what I saw. And of course, you know, I don't say anything. I want to rent the building. So it moves forward. They do get their, their liquor license. Um, there was a, a, a point here now where I'm going to show you a clip where... Um, one of the aldermen uh, says, uh, you know, I'm not going to vote for this. But the reason he doesn't vote for this is because uh, Tina, who was Tanita, uh, uh, sends a, uh, a letter to the, I, I want to say the Hispanic Association and the state somewhere. Well, they send a letter back stating, you know, we feel that there's some, you know, racism here and we, we don't like the way this has been handled. And, uh, you know, he takes objection to it. It's not going to show it on this, but this is his, his comment to why it, why he's no longer, he's not going to uh, support this. There are a number of reasons why 
I would vote against this if it was an accordion bar, if it was a, um, a marching band bar. It has nothing to do with the facility that's going in there. Okay, we'll get to him a little bit later on the other future videos. But now Thomas Holmes shows up. And this is a clip from the documentary where he comes on the scene. And saw the um, sign on the window that it was about to be a um, Latin club. And so then I contacted the owner of the property and um, he discussed to me that they were having some difficulties opening the building, opening the, uh, um, the club. Well, we started there was a upscale nightclub that appealed to all people, nationalities, didn't matter, um, ages 21 and up. And so I worked out a deal with um, the owner and the licensee of that particular business at that time. I think it was called Tanita. Okay, now the uh, business relationship broke up within, uh, with, with Tanita's. Um, so uh, Holmes, myself, the attorney, we meet at a bowling alley and on a Sunday afternoon and we put this deal together that Holmes is now going to be the manager of, uh, of the building, of the, of the business. And I would think within six or eight months later, he be, uh, becomes the uh, liquor agent. So he, he doesn't have to actually apply. He more or less becomes the, he kind of takes the, the, the business over. So that's the real beginning of Park Six. That was roughly about 2009. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do now is we're going to skip ahead to the end of 2011. We'll go back and we'll go through all the incidents that happened and how it happened and, and some of the information that uh, is available. But I want to go to 2011 and now we're going to go to where I am served by the police department as a nuisance property. This is right before uh, Christmas in 2011. So at that point, I had been following what was going on, but now it's in my backyard and I'll be honest with you, I'm pissed off. I'm, I'm like, you know, you're taking the building, you're taking my tenant away from me. Um, I, and, I, and, and we're not talking about, uh, you know, choir boys here. You know, we're talking about bars and taverns and, and nightclubs and, and drinking. So, I mean, there are some, there's some things that go along with that. Um, and I understand that. And uh, this area that I was uh, developing uh, was the was you know just beginning. I mean, there was nothing in these buildings before I purchased them, and um, you know it was the kind of the, the pioneer developing. There was really nothing going on in that area, and and it was coming around. I mean, we were having some success there, and uh, and Thomas uh, you know business was one of them. Um, but I want to move on from from that point and explain how I got involved and why the documentary came about. Next videos that I will do will take off from this point and then we're going to kind of circle back around and uh, go into some of the incidents and some of the um, um, documentation and certain things that uh, make it kind of a more of a detailed uh, experience and like I said the journey. So tune in the next one. I uh, hope to have it out in another week and um, talk to you later. Bye-bye.